In this second section, we will discuss the um, adoption and usage of fixed income ETFs in uh, private client portfolios. So we have different portfolios, different clients. So we have passive, just purely passive. Yes. And then we have um, a mixture of passive and active and direct equities. And then we have uh, portfolios that are just purely active. Okay. So uh, for the passive portfolios, it's all passive mm -hmm. uh, fixed income mm -hmm. ETFs. And it depends on what their risk are. Particularly for the, for the government um, mm -hmm. ETFs, fixed government ETFs, then I don't really see much point in paying higher active manager fees to go in to those sorts of products. Mm -hmm. We have a mixture of the corporate um, fixed income in both active and ETFs. Mm -hmm. the, the smaller a client portfolio, the more we tend to go into the passive vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we tend to go more core, so more long term, mm -hmm. so uh, less tactical on mm -hmm. the fixed income unless we are putting a small proportion of high yield mm -hmm. or emerging market debt. We are probably not the most active users of fixed income ETFs. We, we generally favour uh, active management to a large degree. We do have a, uh, uh, an asset allocation range of funds that are purely passive. Um, but in our, in our active multi-asset funds, the predominant allocations within fixed income are through active managers. Mm -hmm. We have tended to, we tend to use them for tactical purposes when the trade horizon is short. So if we were to go overweight an asset class, we would, um, and, we, and the time horizon was less than a year, we'd expect to probably do that through a, a passive instrument. We also tend to use uh, ETS as a way of hedging cash flows. I mean, I think in discretionary client portfolios, it, it is still a relatively challenged area for us because we don't have the proliferation of hedge share classes across all of the major broad asset classes. That is a, an issue for us that prevents us, I think, from using them more actively. Uh, or, or more uh, systematically, should we say. Um, so I'd say that for us is, is, is a stumbling block that, that limits it. But, but in general, we would tend to favour uh, active management for long-term investment. And it, actually, even in the sovereign space, we've seen, you know, we have a European sovereign manager on, us, on, our, on our buy list that's added 2% alpha annualised since we've had him on the list. And, um, you know, we think there is still scope to, to, to actually outperform in that market. Um, we, we use ETFs often. Uh, especially corporate bond ETFs in the portfolio as um, as adjusters for our overall duration. If we add a long, longer dated, uh, you know, a risky or sub asset class like emerging market uh, uh, hard currency debt, uh, that will bring the duration up of the portfolio. So we might sell some of our longer dated ETFs and buy a shorter dated ETF because of the liquidity of that, of that product, it's very useful in our portfolio for that reason. So the reason that we really uh, utilize ETFs in our portfolios, and we are 100% ETF based, fixed income and equity, is because we believe they're an excellent tool for implementing an asset allocation. Um, not only because they're cost effective, they're efficient and they're transparent, so we can understand and model our risk accurately. Um, but I think there's also some underappreciated aspects of, of ETFs, and particularly fixed income ETFs, when it comes to the transparency on costs. So we understand our market impacts. When we go to trade, we understand exactly what it is going to uh, cost to acquire that basket of bonds. Um, yeah, I think segmentation of, of the bond market is a, is a fantastic uh, initiative uh, in the ETF market. It allows us to be more tactical, as we suggested that maybe uh, investors would, would prefer to be this year rather than just a buy and hold strategy. Um, but I think there's also lots of other innovations. I think there's innovations in smart beta, um, you know, putting fundamental research into a rules-based approach makes a lot of sense, and I think we'll see a lot more of those products going forward. I'm certainly a nightmare for providers, I'm sure other people are, because as an allocator, I want a toolbox. I would like every region hedged and unhedged, duration controlled, credit controlled, and I want all the options, and I probably won't put a lot of assets into most of them, and I'll move <laughs> them around. Um, so, you know, it's a difficult one, but as James says, we want, we want options and tools. And we want them as cheap as possible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the, good, the other good thing about the ETFs is the spreads are so narrow on a bond ETF compared to going and buying the underlying. So it just makes them more accessible for retail clients to be able to use them. Mm -hmm. well, the, the most important thing for, for ETF providers is to have a large investor base uh, of diversified clients who have different views and want to trade these instruments actively. That way you tend to get lots of secondary market activity without having to go to the primary underlying vehicle. 
the more you segment, the more you diversify, the more you create choice for people, it, it's fine. But you need to have enough participants who are willing to take both sides of the trades for those instruments to actually flourish, um, to have the capacity in them, etc. What we've done is we've very much carved up the Barclays Global Ag Index, the broad investment grade, into all the duration buckets. So you can go short duration, long duration, midterm, etc. with um, the different ETFs. The challenge obviously for us in launching product is to ensure that they remain liquid. So if you carve it up too much, then obviously there's not enough bonds and not enough liquidity, which obviously doesn't work for everyone. Um, so for example, on our sterling corporate bond side, you know, we can't carve that market up too much because it's not the most liquid market. The other thing which obviously was raised here as well is providing hedge share classes for all of these different buckets. And I think, you know, the real sort of, you know, challenge for us, which I think you know, Chris alluded to, is getting scale in these products. So, I mean, floating rate note ETFs were very, very popular last year. I mean, that, that was probably the most popular sort of asset class within fixed income ETFs last year. The EM local currency space has been really popular because of that yield differential you, you get versus your domestic market. Um, and just, yeah, it's been a bit more tactical, really. Um, yeah, inflation is something obviously we're all talking about here today. We haven't seen much inflation yet, but we're seeing lots of flow into tips. So I think, you know, people are preparing themselves. They're starting to protect portfolios in case we do see that um, inflation spike up.